If you've played around with natural gas cookers quite a lot, you might have noticed something very interesting. The specific heat of crude oil is 1.69, and the specific heat of sour gas is 12% more than that. It's 1.898. What that means is that if you have sour gas that's, say, 540 degrees, then it contains more heat energy in it than it takes to raise the temperature of crude oil all the way to 540 degrees even if it started out at the same temperature before it turned into sour gas. That's not something that really happens in the real world, but it is something that happens in the fantasy physics of oxygen not included. It should be possible to not only warm up the crude oil hot enough to turn it into sour gas using just the heat energy that's in the sour gas, but you should also have heat energy left over. So you should be able to harvest some of that heat energy using a steam turbine as well. If you can make the heat exchangers efficient enough, you should be able to make a natural gas cooker that runs only off of its own heat energy being produced uh, by the conversion of crude oil into sour gas. In order to really understand how it works, there's two things you need to have a good grasp of. One of them is heat exchangers. I just posted a video last week that demonstrates heat exchangers and many of the principles that are important to understand while you're making them. I recommend watching the video because understanding heat exchangers and when to use them and why they're awesome will make you a much better player. But that doesn't really explain where the energy comes from that keeps the natural gas cooker running. For that we have to look at the specific heat of oil and sour gas. So I got this idea in my head, and I started asking around on forums to see if anybody had any ideas for it, and I didn't get a lot of results. Um, so I started experimenting. For example, here's me experimenting, and here's more of me experimenting, and more, and another. This is a really big one. And here is yet another. This is the first one that I really got working properly, but it's incredibly large and totally impractical to use in an actual game. Yet more experiments. At this point I figured out some why some of the limitations of this kind of heat exchange is a problem. And this one tries some new ideas for heat exchangers. This is the final product. It's still quite big, but I don't think it can be done well using less space. Self-powered natural gas cooker. By that I mean that you don't have to put power into it in order to produce the natural gas. It uses the heat energy from the sour gas to power itself and create more sour gas. Uh, I did not include in that number the amount of power that's used by the gas pumps that remove the natural gas from the, uh, from the device. To me this makes sense because at this point the natural gas has already been created and so what you do from it from that point on to me it doesn't count but interpret that however you like also there's certainly no way to burn natural gas without putting it into a pipe so no matter how efficient your cooker is you'll have to have these pumps in order to use the natural gas so I'll give you a quick tour and then I will give you the longer version of the tour in the big and elaborate ones that I created I was able to get 226 percent efficiency I can't remember exactly how much power it used, but I know that it produced an extra 126% of that in surplus power. This one isn't as big and elaborate. I was making an attempt to make it small enough to make it useful in a regular base and a regular asteroid. I'm not sure I succeeded at that. This is the smallest one that I could make. My first priority was to make it self-powered. My second priority was to make it as small as possible and as simple as possible. And my last priority was to produce surplus power. This version, once it's warmed up, it consumes uh, 1,233 watts continuously, and it produces a surplus of 433 watts continuously. It takes a while to warm up to the point where it's producing that much surplus power, but that seems to be its peak. The oil enters the device here and goes into these 10 valves. Each of those valves emit one kilogram per second of oil. Since there's only one kilogram per second in the pipe, you can change its temperature to any temperature you like and it doesn't undergo a state change until it exits the pipe. This prevents the pipes, the pipes from being broken. The first thing that happens is the oil rises through this heat exchange. The natural gas in this area is cold, so the oil picks up the cold from that. This part of the heat exchange is the condenser. It changes 
sour gas moving down to the heat exchange into methane. The methane runs off the side onto these airflow tiles and is evaporated into natural gas by the, warm, the warmer oil rising through the pipes. The next part of the heat exchange, its only job is to cool the sour gas as much as possible. Steam turbines are busy cooling the hottest part of the sour gas and turning it into power that is used to keep the whole device running. This part of the heat exchange uses the chilled oil rising through these pipes to cool the sour gas. The plumbing for the steam turbines looks quite busy, but it's actually not that complicated. I'm using the water that is produced by the steam turbines to run through the sour gas and cool it down to ideally 95 degrees. Since I use a valve to split the outputs into only one kilogram per second in the pipes that get hot, the, the water doesn't turn into steam until it exits the pipe. The block of tiles in the middle is intended to redirect the sour gas over to the side where the steam turbines can cool it down without being in the way of the 10 oil pipes. The last part of the heat exchange continues warming the oil all the way up to the temperature where it can flash into sour gas when it exits the vent. Also, this cools the sour gas a large degree as it moves down to the heat exchange. There's something really important that happens right at the end. You'll notice that the temperature up here is... Uh, looks like around 900 degrees. This is much hotter than necessary in order to produce sour gas out of oil. But remember, this whole device runs off of excess heat. When the oil flashes into sour gas, that's when the specific heat of the material changes, even though it stays at the same temperature. So, if that difference is 12%, then 12% of 900 degrees is much more excess heat than 12% of 540 degrees. So in order for this device to work, you have to make this state change happen at a very high temperature. At the top of the heat exchange, the heat is produced by this aqua tuner in a room full of steam. You'll notice that I'm letting the heat transmit directly into the chamber that has sour gas, and I want the sour gas to change at the highest temperature possible. This is the best way to do it. This same aqua tuner is used to chill the condenser below that changes the sour gas into methane. So if you are only interested in the quick tour, then I think that's it. So the oil goes into the device here, gets divided up among 10 pipes uh, so that it won't break the pipes, goes through this area to cool it off. Now, the specific heat of natural gas is higher than the specific heat of oil. But since you only produce 6.66 kilograms of natural gas per second, out of 10 kilograms of oil, the total specific heat of the oil rising through this part of the heat exchange is greater than the total specific heat of the natural gas going down through it. That means the temperature of the oil will have a tendency to overpower this area. This, I think, is okay. You'll notice there's another pipe of moving through this part of the heat exchange. It's full of hydrogen. I'll talk about that more in a minute. I really like this kind of methane condenser, largely because it doesn't have a liquid pump to move the methane from one chamber to another. Instead, the methane just gathers on top of the condenser and runs off the side. And since there's only a one tile high opening where it runs off the side, that becomes an airlock between the methane, I'm sorry, the natural gas and the sour gas so that they can't be mixed together. So there's two things that has to happen in order for the condenser to continue to work properly. It can't get too hot and it can't get too cold. If it does get too cold, the liquid tepidizer turns on and warms it up. The liquid tepidizer is almost never used. Surely it would be hard to make this a very efficient natural gas cooker if the liquid tepidizer had to come on very often because it uses a lot of power. When you're first starting up the device, the liquid tepidizer comes on quite a bit and is much more useful. But once it's running, it's barely used at all. In the long term, I believe it uses about 33 watts. The other thing we have to do is prevent this from getting too warm. This thermal sensor turns on to indicate that the coolant needs to be cooled down. All it does is ensure that the aqua tuner at the top of the device is running so that cold coolant is keeping the condenser chilled. You'll notice that the tepidizer has an indicator on it that indicates that it's not connected to power. That's sort of true. Since I essentially have an aqua tuner on the same circuit, it's too much power for this uh, conductive wire. Since the tepidizer doesn't turn on very often, I can just use a battery like this one and power switches to uh, provide it power only when it needs to turn on. This part of the heat exchanger is, in is intended to cool down the sour gas from about 95 degrees all the way down to the point where it condenses into methane. The specific heat of the sour gas moving down through the heat exchanger is greater than the specific heat of the oil moving up through the heat exchanger. This turns out to be a pretty big problem. It means that the heat of the sour gas will always overpower the oil 
and begin to compete with the condenser directly. That's very inefficient. In order to solve this problem, I'm supplementing the specific heat of the oil rising through the heat exchange using this pipe full of hydrogen. Since I'm using 867 grams, the specific heat of the sour gas moving down through the heat exchange is balanced exactly with the specific heat of the oil plus the hydrogen moving up through the heat exchange. As a result, we get a nice gradual temperature change as the sour gas moves down through the heat exchange and good efficiency. This loop of hydrogen is something that I'd like to talk about. It has to be there in order for this part of the heat exchange to be balanced, but it wouldn't make sense just to make it run in a loop because then the heat that it carries from the top would just enter into the bottom. So I sent it down here. Normally, using a loop of a material like this in a heat exchange doesn't work because no matter where the hydrogen entered the heat exchange, it would be the same temperature as wherever as whatever it was at the point where it left the heat exchange. So if it left the heat exchange up here hot, went to the bottom, and entered the heat exchange down here, well, it's still hot. For a heat exchange where one end of the heat exchange is hot and the other end of the heat exchange is cold, that just doesn't work. Really, it's just making the temperatures more average and making the heat exchange inefficient. But this heat exchange isn't like that. It starts out warm, it gets cold, and then it gets warm again. So you can have the, the hydrogen exit the heat exchange at a warm spot, move it down to a different warm spot, put it back in the heat exchange, chill it, warm it up, and then have it exit the heat exchange again. That basically doesn't violate any of the principles for how the heat exchange works. So we can use the hydrogen to balance this part of the heat exchange. Unfortunately, it makes the balance of this part of the heat exchange worse. The oil already has a higher specific heat than the natural gas moving down through the heat exchange, so adding the hydrogen to that just makes it more imbalanced. But I think this is okay. Sometimes I scratch my head and wonder if that makes any sense, because the heat that the hydrogen carries out of the sour gas will ultimately go into the natural gas, be carried by the specific heat towards the condenser anyway, and the condenser will just have to cool it down. But I think what actually happens is because I drop off the heat very close to the gas pumps, that the natural gas that warms up pretty much gets removed from the device immediately, and that way I'm dropping off the heat someplace where it doesn't do any harm. The high specific heat of the sour gas is something you don't want to toy with. It will easily overpower the, the cold of the condenser, and it will become impossible to keep the condenser cold enough if you're not careful. There's a portion of the heat exchange devoted to the steam turbines removing heat as fast as possible from the sour gas so that we can use the power to power the natural gas cooker. You'll see that there's a transition from a radiant pipe to an insulated pipe right along this line. All of the tiles below that line are being cooled by the steam turbines and everything above that line we are not trying to cool. The natural gas cooker is pretty sensitive to the location of that line. If you try to cool off the sour gas above that line using the steam turbines, then we end up sucking up too much heat from the sour gas too soon, and it's hard to make the oil hot enough in order to flash into sour gas later. You'll note this block of tiles in the center. This forces the sour gas moving down through the heat exchange over to the side where it can interact with the steam turbines. The reason it does this is because it's very hard to run more pipes through the center because it's already full of pipes. The liquid pipes related to the steam turbines look very busy, but it's actually not that complicated. Take this one for example. This is the water that comes out of the steam turbine. It just follows this pipe, comes to a valve right here, which splits it into two one kilogram per second pipes. Those pipes run through the sour gas, and pick up heat. It's important that that movement is upwards, by the way, otherwise you'll end up with the coolest water possible instead of the hottest water possible in your steam turbine. After being warmed up, the water in those two pipes just run back to the chamber full of steam and empty themselves out. Since there's only one kilogram per second, the water doesn't change into steam until it exits the pipe. All four of these steam turbines do basically the same thing in the same way. Part of the trouble with this is if the steam turbines are off, like when you're starting the device for the first time, or if you have a pause temporarily, the steam turbines will use up all of their fuel, will stop running, which means water stops coming out of their exhaust, 
which means it stops cooling down the sour gas and there's nothing left to heat up the steam so the steam turbines will never turn on again. In order to avoid that problem I've added this loop of hydrogen. You can see it goes through a very hot part of the sour gas. Its only job is to carry enough heat from the sour gas into the steam to restart the steam turbines in case they ever stop and that seems to work very well. As I mentioned before, this last length of heat exchange is dedicated only to heating up the oil to the temperature it needs to be in order to flash into sour gas. Since the specific heat of the sour gas is higher than the specific heat of the oil, this is an imbalanced heat exchange. But in this case, that's what we want. We want the oil to get very hot. And we'll worry about the excess heat in the sour gas when it gets down here to these steam turbines, because that's their job. The result is we get very hot oil, which flashes immediately in the sour gas when it comes out of these vents. As I mentioned before, it's absolutely imperative that this is done at a high temperature. The higher the temperature this happens at, the more excess heat energy you'll produce, and the more surplus power the steam turbines will output. That happens, of course, because the specific heat of sour gas is 12% higher than the specific heat of oil. 12% of a state change that happens at 1,000 degrees is much, much more than 12% of a state change that happens at 540 degrees. The aqua tuner in this room full of steam produces the heat that essentially drives the entire device. There's two things that have to happen in order to make sure that this doesn't malfunction. That is, it can't get too hot and it can't get too cold. Sometimes the aqua tuner has to run in order to keep the condenser chilled even if the steam is already sufficiently hot. When that happens, there's a steam turbine that will turn on in order to prevent the steam room from overheating and damaging the aqua tuner. This is the thermo sensor that will turn on the steam turbine to cool down the steam if necessary. There's another thermo sensor in the room which makes sure that the aqua tuner will turn on if the steam isn't hot enough. I have this set to a very high temperature. It's a thousand degrees. Right now the temperature is at about 900 degrees. That increases very slowly over time and when it gets close to a thousand degrees then the natural gas cooker will produce its greatest amount of surplus power because it's producing its greatest amount of surplus heat. The aqua tuner is cooling super coolant which I've routed through the hydrogen behind this steam turbine and through the hydrogen behind these steam turbines and through the hydrogen behind these steam turbines in order to keep everything cold that's important to keep cold. Also, of course, its main job is to keep the condenser cold. I have only one circuit connecting all of the things that need power in the entire device. That is really just the aqua tuner and occasionally the liquid tepidizer. Those things are connected directly to the steam turbines which produce all of the power that it needs. I've put a battery on here just so that there's some reserve power in case something hiccups. This cooker has such stable and consistent power generation and consumption that I don't think I've ever seen this battery ever be anything but fully charged. In the end, this was a great exercise to see how efficient a natural gas cooker can be, but I don't actually think it's very practical to be used in an actual asteroid-based game. I used entirely space age materials and I still can't really make it small enough to feel like it's practical. In a real game it seems like it would be much more reasonable to use two aqua tuners and much smaller heat exchange and probably not even bother with the steam turbines. My first video on YouTube was a demonstration of a high capacity natural gas cooker. I still think it's pretty good, but I've learned a lot of new techniques and I don't think I would design the same one now if I did it over again. Since I don't think this turned out to be a very practical application, I'm not going to show it I'm not going to demonstrate how to set it up in an actual base. Also, I've spent really a lot of time working on this concept and I'd rather move on and start a new game using the latest test build.